Hello everyone, this is Experiment Designs in Computer Science, Week 6, Statistical Inference 3, Part 2, Multiple Sample Testing. So, what we're going to talk about in this video is when we want to compare more than two samples. There are many situations in which we are interested in comparing more than two samples at the same time to test if they belong to the same population or not. For example, parameter tuning. Let's say that we have an algorithm and we want to test multiple sets of parameters. For example, we can compare a network with N1, N2, N3, or N4 layers, or even combinations. We have four different combinations of parameters that we want to compare. <clears throat> Another case is when we want to compare multiple algorithms. Instead of only comparing algorithm A with algorithm B, what if we want to compare algorithm A with algorithm B with algorithm C with algorithm D? So what should we do? The first thing that maybe you will think is that you could, only, you could do a t-test for every pair. For example, you could do a t-test of A versus B, and then a t-test of A versus C, and then a t-test of A versus D, etc. Think for a moment, what would be the problem with this approach. Did you think about it? Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, <clears throat> doing repeated tests like that is a common mistake. This is known as multi -wise, pair -wise, multiple pairwise testing. Okay, what's the problem with that? Remember that every test has an associated type one error probability that is the test parameter alpha that we used. When we repeat the same test many times, these probabilities, they are multiplied. And that's the problem of multiple pairwise testing. For example, let's imagine that we're using alpha 0.05, which is a 95% confidence, okay? So with one test, the probability of type one error is 0.05. When we do two tests, the probability of type 1 error becomes 1 minus 0 0.95 times 0 0.95. So the probability of type 1 error increases, it becomes 0 0.09. If we do six tests, and we think about six tests, is testing everyone against everyone with four choices. That's six tests. So this is 1 minus 0 0.95 to the 6th power. And now our confidence is only 75%. It's not 95% anymore. If we do 20 tests, and this is more or less the same as if we did five by five, uh, five options and tested everyone against everyone else, the probability of type one error becomes 64%. That's more than 50%. That's very high. So, as you can see, when you start to increase the number of comparisons, the probability of a type 1 error increases enormously. And sometimes you see papers where people try 50 pairwise tests, 100 pairwise tests. Like for every data set, they do a t-test. Now you know why this is wrong. Okay? Uh, there is a, a cartoon here that gives a very interesting way to think about this. So take a look and see. Let's give you a more concrete example. So how should we do this comparison? Let's imagine that we want to investigate a factory that, that builds paper. Okay, So there's this factory that builds paper, and we know that one of the qualities of the paper is how strong the paper, paper is. Let's call this tensile strength, TS. Okay, Especially when it's industrial paper used for, for instance, covering or um, wrapping products. Okay. <clears throat> it's reasonable to imagine that the type of wood that you use would affect the strength of the paper. So we want to investigate four different types of woods, uh, which one would be best to build the paper, okay? So let's say that we have a limited budget, and because we have a limited budget, we can only produce six runs for each type of wood. So if we have four types of wood, A, B, C, D, we only, only have enough budget to do 24 observations, six for A, six for B, six for C, and six for D. So this means that our experiment has only one experimental factor, which is the type of wood that we are changing. And this experimental factor has four levels, levels A, B, C, and D. 
okay? And we have six replicates for each level. So for each level, we have six replicates. Now, the value that we are interested in observing is the tensile strength TF of the paper. And we want to know if any of the fiber types, any of the wood types, leads to an increase or decrease in the tensile, the mean tensile paper, the mean tensile value of the paper. Now, we are interested if this difference is at least 5 kPa. So differences below kPa are not so interested for us. Okay, And we all, uh, while we don't know the exact standard deviation, we can estimate that the maximum value of the standard deviation should be around 6, 6 kPa for sigma. The desired error for this experiment is alpha 0 0.1, so we're looking, we're targeting a 90% confidence, and beta 0 0.2, so we're targeting a 0. Uh, a 80% power. So, before we start doing the statistics, it's always good to do a descriptive analysis of the experiment first. And there was one report that this, this is, I, was, I thought it was a really good report. So uh, in our descriptive analysis, we obtain the six observations for each paper type, and we plot the box plot for this. And we can see already from the box plot that there are some differences between the papers. We can see, for instance, that paper one, paper A and C have very low variation. Paper B and D have higher variations. Uh, paper D has somewhat of an uneven distribution, which we should investigate why this is happening. Paper C has a clear outlier that is also interesting to see if it's like just it's normal, it's an expected outlier, or if something special happened. Okay. <clears throat> So these characteristics should be taken in account when we do the analysis. Now, remember that the statistical test depends on a statistical model. So what is the statistical model for a test that compares multiple populations, multiple samples? Okay. If we imagine that the output of our experiment, the tensile strength that we measure in one observation is represented by the letter Y, I, J, where Y is the type of paper and J is the number of the repetition. Y, I, J can re be represented by this linear model. Mean of I is the mean of that particular paper plus the error of that particular observation. Now, we can break down this linear model into this effects model, which is mu plus tau i plus C epsilon ij. Mu is the overall mean. It's the general mean of the process. This would be the mean if every, all the papers were the same thing. And if we assume that every, all the papers have the same effects, we can just take all the observations and we can take the ground mean. Now, if we think that the papers might have an effect, we can represent this effect as tau i. Tau i is the change of the mean that is realized by the type of paper i. And finally, we have the, e the epsilon ij, which is the difference caused by unknown factors, by random chance. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when we are calculating the statistical test, we can think of the, we can employ these models and we can do some assumptions. For example, we can assume that the unknown errors follow a normal distribution that is approximately normal with zero mean and sigma square variation. The sigma square is the expected variation of the process. So what does this assumption mean? The, the assumptions of the model means that what we are looking is a process like this. We have four types of paper, and each type of paper has some error based on unexpected factors, and this error can be modeled as a normal curve. So we have four normals. Each of these normal corresponds to one different type of papers. All of these normal have approximately the same error that is symbolized by sigma, and there is a grand mean and the mean of each paper is the grand mean plus the effect of that paper. So, the interest in this experiment is that we want to know if there is any difference between the different paper types or if all the paper types are the same. 
So in this case, we can say that our new hypothesis is that all paper types are the same. And if all paper types are the same, this means that all these tall, tall 1, tall 2, tall 3, and tall 4, they are all the same, they are all zero. If all the talls are zero, then all these curves will collapse into a single curve around the ground mean mu. Okay? Now, the alternate hypothesis here is that at least one tau i is different from all the others. Right now, for this test, this is a very general test, we're not saying which one is different. We're just saying, look, we look at all this data, and for this factor, paper type, at least one of the levels shows a significant difference from the others. If we collect the data randomly with constant experimental conditions, except for the level that we specified, then we say that we have a completely randomized design. This completely randomized design is a name that you can use to learn more about this kind of experiment. So, <clears throat> what is this fixed effect models? The approach, this approach that we described to model the mean effects is known as fixed effect models. Okay? Each level has a fixed effect on the grand mean that is represented by tau. This approach is appropriate when we're testing hypotheses where the factor levels are defined. So we choose the four types of papers. That means that we are defining the factor levels that are investigated. Just note that this uh, model is not appropriate if you want to extrapolate the results. So for instance, based on the results that we are going to analyze here, we cannot say anything about a type, a fifth type of paper. And this may seem obvious, but let's think, of, let's think of an analogous situation, which is comparing different kinds of parameters. Let's say that we have five sets of parameters that we compare using this model. The results of this comparison, in general, cannot be applied to a sixth type of parameter. Unless it's like something very general, we did not manage to reject the new hypothesis at all, that would be evidence towards thinking that maybe this all, parameter, all parameters in these observed don't affect, but still then we could imagine that there are some parameters, some specific parameters that would affect, the, uh, would affect our experiment. So be very careful. The fixed effects model in general cannot be used to generalize beyond the facts that you are studying. Let, wait, let's go back to the derivation of the model. So as we mentioned, we have this linear model, yij is mu plus tau i plus epsilon ij. Now, under the new hypothesis, all ti are equal to zero. So that is our new hypothesis. If we have this new hypothesis, okay, <clears throat> We can express the variability of the data by the difference between the mean of y and each observation. And now we have two different uh, differences that we are interested. The differences that are because of the tall and the differences that are because of the individual observations. So we can represent the total sum of squares that represents the sum of deviations between each observation and the overall sample mean. So the total sum of squares would be each observation minus the mean is squared, and that's the sum of them. We can break this into two components. One component is the sum of squares equivalent to the levels. So this is the errors that are affected by the levels. The others is the sum of squares equivalent to the epsilons. These are the errors associated with the observations. Okay. Now, if we separate them, then we can take the mean squares error, and we have the mean squares for the levels and the mean squares for everything. Okay. We expect that the mean squares for the the errors for the epsilon should be approximately equal to sig uh, sigma square. So the mean square should be approximately equal to the expected variance. On the other hand, the errors of the level is biased by the effect of each level. So the mean square error of the levels is the, uh, the variance of the, the, the expected variance of the project process plus 
a factor that is proportional to the size of the effect of the error, the levels. Now, this means that we have two types of errors. We have an error that is affected by the natural variation of the process and an error that is affected by the variations of the levels. Now, if we remember that under the new hypothesis, tau i was zero, if tau i is zero, if the new hypothesis is true and every tau is zero, then this becomes zero. This is a sum of zero. And if this becomes zeros, then the error of the levels becomes equal to the error of every individual observation. So this is the test that we are going to try. This is the statistical test. We're going to obtain the data from the experiment and we want to see if the error of each level is equivalent to the total error. If the error of each level is equivalent to the total error, this indicates that the effects of the levels is zero. If the error of the levels is bigger than the total error, this indicates that the effects of the levels is not zero. Okay? So we have the F statistic. So F0 is the proportion between the mean square error of the levels over the mean square error overall. And this F statistic will be distributed according to an F distribution with a minus one degree of freedom. Okay? So <clears throat> we have the, we can, if the new hypothesis is false, the expected value of the MS levels is larger than that of MSE. And the result is that F0 will be larger. And using this, we can use that idea of calculating the critical region. What would be the critical region for the F statistic that would say that the probability of a type 1 error is below our confidence level? Okay, so now the test becomes very similar to the t test and the z test that we studied before. We have the distribution of the F statistic and we calculate the probability of the F0 that we observe, observed under this distribution of the F statistic. Now, on R, it's very easy to calculate. It's, uh, we, first, we calculate the model, the, the variance model, which is analysis of variance. Um, and this is a R syntax that says KPI explained by the factor fiber type. So this says, okay, here are our values that we are interested, and here are the levels that will explain those values. And then this will generate a model, uh, uh, this will generate a variance model. If we look at the summary, the first thing that the summary gives us is the F value, okay? And we can see here that our F value is 13, and oh, this is a little bit, um, so, here is the squared mean. Uh, sorry, this is the sum of this is the sum of squares. This is the mean the mean sum of squares. Uh, sorry, this is the degrees of freedom. This is the sum of the squares. This is the mean of squares, and this is the f value. And you can see that the f value thirteen is very high, which indicates that the fact the the effect of the factor levels is very strong. We have a very low p value, so this indicates that for this data set. Each of the levels has a, a very significant influence on the mean. The difference of the mean between the levels is statistically significant. Okay. Now, this is called ANOVA, and ANOVA means analysis of variance, which makes sense because we are analyzing the difference of variance between the data as a whole and the data for each level. Okay. So, what does this mean? <clears throat> what does this low p-value mean? Remember that the new and alternative hypothesis for the ANOVA. The new hypothesis for ANOVA is ti is zero for every i. The alternative hypothesis for ANOVA is that there is at least one i, one ti, that is not zero. So when we reject the new hypothesis for ANOVA, the conclusion that we can take is that there is at least one level with a fact significantly different from zero, okay? But which one is the level? So one thing that is important to notice is that the ANOVA only tells us that the difference between the levels, there is at least one level that there is a difference that is bigger than chance. There is a statistically significant difference for at least one level. It doesn't tell us which level has the statistical significance difference. 
So after we reject the new hypothesis in the ANOVA, then we need to check which level is the difference. Also, we need to verify what are the assumptions of the ANOVA and if they are satisfied. So the ANOVA model is based on three assumptions uh, about the residuals of our model, about the difference of, of, between, of the great mean of our model. The first assumption that is very important is independence. The second assumption is homocedacidity. And homocedacidity is the equality of variances. If the variances are different in the different groups, uh, you really cannot calculate ANOVA very well. And finally, we have normality of the residuals, normality of the difference between the mean and each of the values. The residuals is obtained as this. Eij, the residual Ij, is the value of Ij minus the grand mean. Okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, we can also extract the residuals directly from the model using model residuals. So you can use residuals to, from, to get the residuals directly for R and test your assumptions. So first, let's go to the normality assumption. The normality assumption is very easy to calculate. We can use the Shapiro test and we can also use QQ tests to test the normality. We talked a lot about normality in the last, in the last few videos. Okay. Now, ANOVA is relatively robust to some violation of normality, as long as the other assumptions are verified, especially uh, the uh, equal variances assumption. Okay? If the sample size is not large, or if the other assumptions cannot be verified, then we should use a non-parametric test. Some non-parametric tests for multiple comparisons that you can use is the Kruskal Wallis that we talked in the last video, or if you're used paired non-parametric test, you want to try the Friedman test. And I encourage you to study this test by yourself. Now, the almost the CDC um, variation, I'm pretty sure I'm saying this word wrong. Anyway, this assumption says that the variations are similar. You can test then using the Fligner test. And ANOVA is relatively modest, robust to small variations as long as the sample is balanced. The sample balance means that all the levels have the same number of observations. Finally, we have the independence assumption. And as you know, the independence assumption must be guaranteed on the design stage, okay? as well as on the analysis. The independence assumption is very important. There were a few reports on this uh, for report one where the experiment did not follow in the, the independence assumption. Now, if you're not going to do a t-test or a statistical test, in general, you don't have to worry about the independence in those cases, but you still need to worry if the independence assumption will influence your results or not, okay? To, so the ANOVA can be quite sensitive to variations of independence. So you need to be very careful that your data is independent when you are applying the ANOVA model to it. So if the assumptions for the ANOVA are verified, now we need to find which of the levels showed the significance that the ANOVA indicated. Now, there are different ways to do this. Uh, uh, you can, for instance, compare all the levels against all the other levels, or we can compare all the levels against a standard value, or for instance, we can compare one level that is a new proposed method against all the others and see which ones perform better or worse than the normal level. However, this decision needs to be done at the design stage. You cannot do something like first do the ANOVA and then look at the data and decide, oh, after I look at the data, I will do an O versus O. Oh, an O versus O will not give me enough difference. So I'll do an O versus one. Oh, O versus one does not give me enough difference. So I will just compare the two, ba the, the two ba best ones or the two worst ones, or I will just compare the more traditional one against everyone else. Deciding which of these variations you do after you obtain the data is known as harking. Harking means hypothesizing after the results are known. That is a problem that um, it causes researcher biases 
and it highly inflates the probability of a false positive. Why is that? If you have a big matrix of results and an ANOVA is basically a big matrix, you have different levels and you'd have information of all levels against all other levels. It's very easy to find some sort of information there. If you really want to find a statistically significant and you have a lot of data, it's possible to choose a subset of that data that shows you the statistical significance that you want. Okay, so if you decide which data you're going to use after you obtain the data, there's a very high chance that this decision was influenced by the fact that you want a positive result. So you should decide what analysis you do before you obtain the data to avoid that kind of biases, to avoid harking. Okay, I recommend that you see this CUR 1998 to a further discussion about this subject. Okay, uh, there are types of comparisons. The planning of multiple comparisons must be guided by the tactile. So how do we decide which, co which comparison we do? Okay, whenever possible, we must choose the technique that gives us the smallest numbers of comparison, because even if we're taking the care that I'm gonna talk about now, multiple comparisons is still multiply the uh, the probability of type 1 error, and also multiple comparisons increase the cost of an experiment. So we want to reduce the cost and we want to reduce the chance of type 1 error. So we want to be parsimonious, we want to use the minimal number of comparisons that we can. Okay? So some questions that we have is how does one level compare to the others? Or how all comparisons compare against the grand mean? Or how all comparisons compare to each other all versus all? So these are some possible comparisons that we can have, some, pos some possible post hoc comparisons. <clears throat> the multiple comparisons performed after ANOVA are basically a series of the tests. So after we perform the ANOVA, we perform a, a series of the t-tests based on what we decided to compare. Okay, but we have some small modifications. If the assumptions of the ANOVA are verified, we already know that the groups have the same, uh, the, the, uh, similar variances, and we know that the variance can be estimated by MSC. So we can use this estimated variance in our t-test with this number of degrees of freedom. We also know that we can re we have an inflated possibility of type 1 error. So what we do is that on the post hoc test, we modify our alpha to take into account the number of comparisons that we do. So we modify the alpha. This is called an alpha correction. I'm going to talk about two types of alpha correction to reduce the, num the, reduce the probability of type 1 error. So there are many ways to adjust the alpha value. Okay. Two of the most common are the Bonferroni correction and the CDAC correction. Let's say that we want to do K comparisons. For example, let's say that we want to compare all the types of wood against the grand mean. So that would be four comparisons. Wood A against the mean, wood B against the mean, wood C against the mean, and wood D against the mean. So we can use this adjusted alpha equal to the alpha, the general alpha divided by k. That's the very simplest one, the Bonferroni correction. The Bonferroni correction is very conservative, which means that it results in a very strong alpha, but the cost of it is that we lose power. We might want to use a less conservative correction, such as the CDAC, where alpha adjusted is 1 minus 1 minus alpha of the family to the power of 1 over k. This is a slightly smaller correction that gives us a little bit more power. There are other corrections that include things like changing the number of uh, sample, samples in each, in each um, group or taking other things into account. And if you're interested in this, I encourage you to go and look for other type of alpha corrections for your experiment. Some final considerations about multiple comparison. The kinds of comparisons that we do after the ANOVA must be planned in advance, as we said before. It will influence your data collection, so you know, you know in advance how much N you have, and also the sample size calculations. Okay? There are sample size formulas for ANOVA. 
okay but they are general and sometimes you want something more specific to what you want okay that was the summary about how to use ANOVA for multiple comparisons I hope that you enjoyed this and have a nice weekend.